Hello and welcome to Lockdown Oslo and this talk about semantic maps. My name is Steve Pepper and this is my trial lecture for the degree of PhD in linguistics at the University of Oslo. At this point I share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. So, as I said, this is my trial lecture, so I'll start by thanking my adjudication committee for choosing this very interesting topic. That's Maria Kopchevskaya tam William Croft and Helge Lerdrup. The purpose of a trial lecture is to document the candidate's ability to convey research-based knowledge to a target group of advanced students of the subject, but no original research is a requirement. The assigned reading for this talk is uh, two seminal state-of-the-art papers, the first by Martin Huspelmutt from 2003, called The Geometry of Grammatical Meaning, Semantic Maps and Cross-Linguistic Comparison, and a more recent paper by Thanasis Yurikokopoulos and Stefan Polis from 2018, The Semantic Map Model, State-of-the-Art and Future Avenues for Linguistic Research. Here's a, an outline of the talk. I'll start by focusing on the state of the art in 2003, talk about the issue of multifunctionality in grammar, basic principles of semantic maps, how to create semantic maps, terminology, diachrony, lexical semantic maps, universal conceptual space, mental reality, and some of the advantages of semantic maps. And then I'll go on to talk about the state of the art as of 2018, and attempt to bring it up to 2020 for you. We'll start with issues with what uh, Jörgo Kopoulos and Polis call classical semantic maps, and we'll talk about the alternative, which are called proximity maps. I'll briefly mention some of the coverage in the literature, and then we will return to the topic of lexical semantic maps. Following that, we move on to diachronic lexical semantic maps and constructional semantic maps. And to finish up, we'll talk about some data collection issues and how to automatically plot a semantic map. Uh, and again, this will lead us into some additional advantages of semantic maps. Throughout the lecture, I'll be uh, talking about a number of examples of semantic maps covering domains like the dative, indefinite articles, reflexives, words that, that mean wood and tree, number systems, motion events, the notion to breathe, and time-related events. So let's start with classical semantic maps as of anno 2003. Martin Hussmann starts his seminal paper by talking about the issue of multifunctionality in grammar, and he gives three examples, the English preposition on, the English preposition to, and the English past tense. And we'll be using the, uh, the second example quite a lot, so let's go through that in some detail. Here we see four different functions of the preposition to, uh, direction, recipient, experiencer, and purpose. Goethe went to Leipzig as a student, that's direction. Eve gave the apple to Adam, that's the recipient. This seems outrageous to me, here to is marking the experiencer and I left the party early to get home in time, where to is uh, marking the purpose. Aspelmatt talks about three different approaches to multifunctionality. The, uh, the problem that one and the same word or uh, gram uh, can have uh, multiple meanings. There's the monosemist approach, which basically says that there's only one word here, two, uh, and it just has one very broad meaning. The polysemist approach says that 
There is just the one word too, but it has multiple different meanings, related meanings. And their homonymist approach says, actually, all these words too are different. They're four different words. Haspelmatt then goes on to talk about rival explanatory modes for this uh, multifunctionality. First, the list method, which is what you typically find in an old school Latin grammar, where the functions of the dative will be explained through a subclassification of the dative into things like the dativus finalis, the dativus commodi, and the dativus possessivus, etc., etc. That's one method. And then there is the general meaning method, which others sometimes use. And the example given here is a quote from, from a grammar. The dative serves as the limit of the predicate in the sense that it indicates the ultimate term to which the action or process referred to tends. So it has to be a very, very general definition in order to capture all of these functions, obviously. But both of these methods are language specific. The first one uh, clearly relates to Latin. The second one could uh, be any language, uh, but uh, it would be different for each language. So neither of these methods or explanatory modes are useful in cross-linguistic research. And that's where topic maps comes in. When I say topic maps, I mean, of course, semantic maps. The basic idea of semantic maps is that it's both a method for describing and illuminating patterns of multifunctionality of grammatical morphemes, which we will call grams from now on. Two is an example of that. And it is a geometrical representation of functions in conceptual space linked by connecting lines and that thus constituting a network or graph. So here we have an example uh, showing the functions of the dative. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different functions here. Uh, the ones in the bottom left corner are the four that we remember from the English example, direction, recipient, experience, and purpose. Uh, and the other four uh, come from research into other languages. And the point about this is that the configuration of functions is claimed to be universal. Once you have a map like this, representing the conceptual space of the dative, you can start to map individual linguistic items, in this case, grams, onto it. So, in the case of English 2, we have the experiencer, direction, recipient, and purpose. In the case of French, we have French R also covers experiencer, direction, and recipient, but it doesn't cover purpose. You can't say, j'ai quitté la fête, tout a arrivé à la maison en bon temps. You have to use pour uh, rather than a. But it also has an additional function, you can say, ce chien est à moi, the predicative possessor, this dog is mine. Uh, in English, you can obviously not say, this dog is to me. So, French maps a different area of the conceptual space. The French uh, are preposition. The important point to note here is that for each language examined, the functions are arranged in such a way that each gram occupies a contiguous area on the semantic map. This is the contiguity hypothesis. Basically what it means is that you can't have uh, uh, a gram which expresses recipient and purpose, for example, without also ex ex um, expressing direction because there is no line joining recipient and purpose. So how do semantic maps work? The key idea is that the multifunctionality of a gram occurs only when the various functions of the gram are similar. And similarity can be expressed topologically by closeness of nodes in representational, representational space or by connecting lines. The connecting lines are crucial to distinguishing between configurations. So here, A and B are not the same map. With A, you can have a language in which 
uh, which, uh, in which there is a gram expressing the functions A and B, even though it might not express C. In the second example, you cannot have a lang language or a gram where A and B are expressed unless also C is expressed. Okay. The simplest map is one dimensional. So the, uh, if we look at um, A above, the, uh, the functions B, C and D correspond to a sim simple one dimensional map as do A, C and D. Most maps, however, are two dimensional like the ones we've been looking at. And in this notation, line length and orientation are not significant. So how do you create a semantic map? Well, the first step is to select the functions. The functions are things like the direction, purpose, recipient, etc. And you put a function on the map if there is at least one pair of languages that differ with respect to that function. So English and French do not provide evidence to differentiate direction and recipient because to and a are used for both. But German does. For direction, you use zu or nach. And for recipient, you use the dative case. And this therefore justifies us separating direction and recipient as two separate functions. Once you've done that, you carry on examining languages until basically no more functions turn up. And then you move on to step two, which is to connect the functions, and that's a manual process. So if we focus on the three functions, uh, purpose, direction, and recipient, there are three possible ways of connecting them. You can have purpose, direction, recipient. You can have direction, purpose, recipient. Or you can have direction, recipient, purpose. From the perspective of English 2, any of these orders works. But French R tells us that B does not work because the preposition A cannot express purpose. Remember, you have to use poor. So B is out. Evidence from German zu tells us that C does not work because you cannot use zu to express the recipient, although you can use it both for direction and purpose. So it's the evidence from the different grams in various languages which tells us how we connect the functions together with lines. And you keep on examining more languages and you adjust the map until no more connections turn up. A few further points. It's usually enough to look at a dozen diverse languages in order to arrive at a stable map that doesn't undergo significant changes. And this means that interesting hypotheses can be generated quickly. Furthermore, any new language can falsify a map and require a revision. And this is actually a good thing. Falsification in, uh, in science is something we should strive for, or at least falsifiability. Now, if every function links to every other, the map is said to be vacuous. So let's go back to our dative map here and look at the direction recipient purpose uh, corner of it. If it should turn out that there is a gram in some language in which, which expresses recipient and purpose, but not direction, we would have to add an additional line. And we then get a vacuous map. It's not particularly interesting, except that it shows that these three functions are closely related. Why isn't it interesting? Because it doesn't make any predictions. The previous version makes the prediction that any language or any gram in any language which expresses recipient and purpose will also express direction. Once you add this in, you can no longer make that statement. The semantic map is claimed to be universal in that it makes predictions about possible languages that are easy to test on new languages. And that's one of its great advantages. It's worth noting that uh, in one and the same language, you have multiple grams expressing uh, different functions. Uh, so we've already seen English two and French are, and the way in which they uh, express the functions of the dative. 
In French, you also have dative clitics, me, te, lui, nous, vous, and le. So basically, uh, me, you, him, us, you, and them. And these with these clitics, you cannot express direction. You can't say, je lui vais, uh, I go to him. Um, and you cannot use it for the predicative possessor. You cannot say, ce livre me, this book is mine, to mean this book is mine. But you can use it to express the beneficiary. Je lui ai trouvé un emploi. I found a job for her. And you can also use it to express the external possessor. On lui a cassé la jambe. They broke his leg. So the French dative occupies a different part of the conceptual space to the French preposition a, but overlaps for two of the functions. Note on terminology before we move on. The term semantic map was fairly widely used in the 1990s. Uh, Huspelmatt himself in 1997 in his book on indefinite pronouns uses the term implicational map to highlight the fact that semantic maps express implicational universals. Others have used the terms mental map or cognitive map on the assumption that the universal configuration of functions directly corresponds to the cognitive structuring of meaning. Bill Croft, in his book Radical Construction Grammar, makes an important distinction between con conceptual space on the one hand, which is the universal configuration of functions, and the semantic map, which is a language particular instance of this. In Croft's words, I've chosen the term conceptual instead of the term semantic for two reasons. First, I want to em emphasize the fact that the structures are not merely semantic in the traditional narrow truth functional sense of that term. Conceptual space also represents conventional pr pragmatic or discourse functional or information structural or even stylistic or social dimensions of the use of a grammatical form or construction. Second, there are some good reasons to differentiate between a language universal conceptual structure and a language specific semantic structure. I've also chosen the term space instead of map in order to distinguish the universal conceptual space from the map of a particular, lang particular language's categories onto the space. So let's look at another example, indefinite pronouns. English has three series of indefinite pronouns, the some series, someone, something, somewhere, the any series, anyone, anything, anywhere, etc., and the no series, no one, nothing, nowhere, etc. Russian has just two. There is a prefix to, uh, which is used to express the things like someone, something, somewhere, and a, a suffix nibud, which expresses anyone, anything, anywhere, etc. So the two series overlap in their distribution, but they don't coincide. And what Haspelmatt did was to develop a semantic map to describe the differences and similarities in the function of indefinites in 40 languages. And this is the map he came up with. We see that the English sum maps onto one contiguous region of the map and the English any onto a different or overlapping section of the map. Russian, on the other hand, does things slightly differently. And as of 2003, no counterexamples to this map have been found. Let's look now at reflexives and related functions. So reflexives are grammatical morphemes that express, express reflexive action and a number of related senses that often involve intransitivization. For example, the French se. Judas se tué. Judas killed himself. That's the full reflexive function of se. Batseba se lave. Bathsheba washed is the grooming function, literally Bathsheba washed herself. Then we have the body motion function, essentially Mahmud kneeled himself down. The naturally reciprocal function, Elizabeth and Mary met themselves or each other. 
and the anti-causative function, literally, the door opened itself. And note that some of these non-reflective functions are sometimes called the, the middle voice. So here we have a map of reflexives and related functions. We see the uh, full reflexive, the grooming, body motion, anti-causative, potential passive and naturally reciprocal uh, functions that French S expresses. And Russian Ch is similar to French S, but not identical. So that's how it maps onto the conceptual space. And then Turkish has three different grams, suffixes, uh, which express these kinds of functions, and they too map differently from the other languages, but all onto contiguous parts of the conceptual space. Now I'd like to say a, a few words about diachrony, that's the historical study of, uh, of language. Semantic maps are also an important tool for diachrony. It's not just about looking at the synchronic state of the language, but the way in which languages have changed over time. So in particular, grammaticalization studies. They show how some changes presuppose others. For example, that direction can lead to recipient, which can lead to predicative possessor. Gives us the prediction that if a direction marker, such as the Latin ad to, which later gave rise to French a, if that's extended to additional functions and comes to express predicative possession, it must have been extended to recipient before. So that's a diachronic claim, a claim about what's happened in history. In the semantic map, directionality is represented using arrows like this. And the evidence comes from two possible sources. The first is attested diachronic changes. So for example, the development of English to and French a from direction to recipient. That's something we know about. We have evidence in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the data for that. Sometimes the direction of change is not known and that explains the absence of arrowheads on some of the lines in the diagram above. We can really only be certain that a change is unidirectional only if there are numerous attested cases and no counterexamples. So again, uh, falsifiability is, uh, is present. Further evidence for directionality comes from the substance of the meanings. We know that general grammaticalization generally entails unidirectional bleaching and extension of meaning as when the concrete spatial meaning component of two is lost in recipient and purpose. So this kind of knowledge from language can also help us infer the direction of the, of the changes that have taken place. Sometimes directionality is systematic and then we can talk about slopes. Let's look at our example of reflexives again. Um, we abstract away from a little part of the map and we add on the emphatic reflexive, which is known to be the origin, the source of the full reflexive. Um, for example, evidence from the English himself. Uh, you can say the mayor herself opened the ex ex exhibition. That's the emphatic reflexive. And the mayor admires herself, which is the full reflexive. So we know that the emphatic reflexive is the source of uh, these other um, functions. In classical Latin, you have the word se, as in se videt or se movet, which expresses the full reflexive and grooming or body motion. Classical Latin developed into late Latin and in the process se was extended to also cover the function of the anti-causative. French developed from late Latin and the function of se was extended even further to also include the potential passive as in son livre se vend bien, her book sells well. In Italian, se has become si and extended its function even further. So you can say si è evitata una tragedia, 
a tragedy was avoided. In the Romance language, uh, the sir has become a prefix and it has the same extent as Italian C, except that it's lost the function of the full reflexive. And in Swedish, which is obviously not uh, derived from Latin, but uh, has followed a similar evolutionary path, the reflexive suffix s um, covers just the anticausative, the potential passive and the passive. Now, the point is that the functional extension of a, of, uh, of a gram has its limits. It cannot go on acquiring new functions indefinitely. At some point, a novel expression may appear at the beginning of the slope. So what's happened, for example, in classical Latin is that se has been reinforced as ipse in order to express the emphatic reflexive. In, uh, in Romansh, which has lost the full reflexive, se has been um, extended into the form suse, uh, as in vesa el suse, he sees himself. So, and, and in Swedish, uh, the uh, grooming body motion function, um, we see that sai, uh, vaskasai, um, as in Vaskasai has been used to, has come in to, to replace the old reflexive. This kind of development uh, leads Martin Huspelmatt to a, a, a very nice uh, conclusion, <clears throat> which is that a grammatical morpheme is like a window that opens the view onto part of semantic space. The window gradually moves in one direction over the map, and as new views come into view, as new functions come into view on one side, some old functions disappear on the other side. So, so far we've been focusing on grams, grammatical morphemes. Let's move on to lexemes, lexemes that denote meanings like woods and trees. Because the problem of multifunctionality arises in the same way with lexical meanings as it does with grammatical meanings. And semantic maps are applicable here as well. Here's an example, a famous example from Yemslev in 1963, uh, in which he showed how four different languages lexicalize the meanings of tree and wood and similar. So we have five meanings here or functions tree, wood, the material, firewood, a small forest, what we would call in English a wood, and a large forest, i.e. in English a forest. German has the word Baum, which only denotes the meaning tree. It has a word Holz, which denotes both wood, the material, and firewood, and the word Wald, which denotes a small forest and a large forest. Norwegian has two words, tre and skog. Tre denotes tree, wood and firewood, and skog denotes small forest and large forest. In French, you have three words, arbre for tree, bois for wood, firewood or small, for small forest, and forêt for large forest. And in Spanish, you have five different words for these five different meanings. Albol, Madera, Lenya, Bosque, and Selva. Martin Hasselmann comments that being a structuralist, Yelmslev uses this example to show how different languages carve up the semantic space in radically different ways. But from the present perspective, the differences are not all that great. One could e easily imagine the differences to be such that no non-trivial universal semantic map can be drawn. Thus, Yelmslev's own example can be used to make a very different point, not for relativism, but for universalism of meaning. At this point, we should say something about implicational maps and implicational hierarchies, hierarchies which is that semantic maps should not be confused with implicational hierarchies, which are a different uh, model, different but related model in uh, typological research. 
Both of them stand for a series of implicational universals, but implicational hierarchies are a much stronger statement. Implicational hierarchies do not involve multifunctionality, merely the existence of several different words or more generally patterns. So here's a simple example from the domain of number, number systems. If we think of the meanings 10, 100, 1000 and million, we see that there are some languages which have a word for 10, but no word for 100, 1000 or million, such as Tauya. Shoshone has, a word, has words for 10 and 100 or 100, but not word, no words for thousand and million. Latin had words for ten, hundred and thousand, but not for million. And English, of course, has words for each of these. The point about an implicational hierarchy is that the existence of one item, for example, thousand in a language, makes a prediction about all the items up to the beginning of the hierarchy, in this case, ten and hundred. So you can basically say, if the language has a word for thousand, you can be sure that it also has words for 10 and 100. If a language has a word for million, you can be sure that it has words for 10, 100 and 1000. If it has a word for 100, you can't say anything about whether or not it has a word for 1000 and million. Okay. So an implicational hierarchy allows far fewer language types than an implicational or semantic map and thus makes much stronger predictions about what is possible in language and what is not. Turning now to this notion of universal conceptual space, semantic maps are a powerful methodological tool for cross-linguistic and diachronic semantic studies, but they're also highly relevant for the study of semantics itself. Semantics, the study of meaning, is difficult because unlike phonetic substance, Semantic substance cannot be measured or observed objectively. It's all up in the head, right? Uh, phonetic substance, the sounds we make and the words we make, you can measure that. Uh, you can see the movement of the lips uh, and you can measure the, uh, the, the frequencies uh, and the wavelengths and these things. And um, uh, it's physical. But semantics is all mental. It's all up in the head. And so it's, you cannot observe it directly. And that means that linguists have mostly shied away from speculation about universal semantic structures, concentrating instead on the semantic analysis of particular expressions in particular languages. And this is much safer ground, but it means that the study of meaning is confined to the historically accidental structures of particular languages. Sem semantic maps let us go a step further. They're firmly rooted in empirical observation of individual languages, but through systematic cross-linguistic comparison, we can arrive at well-motivated structural patterns in universal conceptual space. But the question of the mental reality of this conceptual space cannot be answered with the linguist tools, and one should not claim more than the evidence warrants. There are two possible fallacies that one can fall into. One is the generality fallacy, for example, we can make a claim about the close relationship between the spatial and temporal senses of in, in Oslo, the spatial sense, and in November, the temporal sense. Um, we can claim that these two uses of in have a very close relationship, but we cannot claim that this is also the speaker's generalization. The polysemy trap would be a claim based solely on the linguist's imagination that the four senses of on, in on the table, on the wall, on a hook, on a tree, can be attributed to speakers' mental representations. But cross-linguistic comparison does allow certain steps to be taken. For example, take the question of whether on, in a fly on the table, and a fly on the wall, are mentally represented as the same item or as a different item. Evidence from English is inconclusive. Evidence from other languages strengthens the different analysis. For example, in German, you use two different prepositions, eine Fliege auf dem Tisch and eine Fliege an der Wand. Conversely, a lack of such evidence makes the same analysis more plausible. 
So at this point, let's uh, summarize some of the advantages of semantic maps for typology. First of all, there is neutrality with respect to the monosemy polysemy distinction. It avoids the problem stemming from the monosemic and the polysemic approaches, neither of which are well suited to cross-linguistic comparison. It gives you a neutral perspective which facilitates cross-linguistic comparison, and it can be fruitfully used in various frameworks. Secondly, flexibility. The nodes in a semantic map can be grammatical, grams, lexical, like the words for tree and wood that we saw earlier, or constructional. We'll talk about that later. And this means that any area of language can be investigated with a single method. There's no need to discriminate between the various kinds of meaning. And thirdly, semantic maps are both implicational and falsifiable. They articulate implicational hypotheses that are deemed to be universally valid, but only as long as they are not falsified, that's to say contradicted by new imperial, empirical evidence. Semantic maps also have advantages for the study of semantics. They provide a semantically holistic view allowing both the onomasiological and the semasiological perspectives to be combined. So first, it allows you, they allow you to answer the questions about how languages express particular meanings or entire semantic fields. That's the onomasiological perspective. So, for example, the meaning wood is designated by tree in Norwegian, bois in French, holz in German and madera in Spanish. In addition, they capture intralinguistic information, such as that the French bois and forêt and are near synonyms for the meaning forest. Secondly, semantic maps allow you to chart the different meanings of particular linguistic units in a given language. That's the, the, the perspective of semasiology. So for example, the lexical unit tre in Norwegian covers the meanings tree, wood, and firewood. They can also reveal cross-linguistic polysemic patterns, such as that Norwegian skog and German Wald cover a similar region of the map. So much for the state of the art in 2003. Let's move on now to recent advantages uh, based on a paper from 2018 and some additional information which I received as late as Wednesday of last week. So, Jörg Kopoulos and Polis start by enumerating certain issues with what they call classical semantic maps. The first is that the model overgenerates and favours high coverage over high accuracy. For example, the map of indefinite pronouns that we've been looking at allows 105 different possibilities for ma mapping a linguistic form whereas only 39 are actually found in the data set. It would be nice if we were able to express the fact that the other 66 functions do not occur, but you cannot do that in a map that looks like this. So here we have those nine functions of the indefinite pronoun now with numbers and uh, here we see the, uh, the table of uh, different combinations that are found in the, the languages that Haspelmatt uh, examined. We see that uh, there is a function in Russian which uh, only maps the one, of, uh, sorry, a gram in Russian which only maps one of the functions. Um, in uh, English, sum maps one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, in Latin, Ali and Greek, ka. Uh, map two, three, uh, express two, three, four, and five, etc., etc. But there are many combinations here which are not found. So, for example, let's find two, three, and four doesn't exist. There is no gram found in any of the languages which expresses two, three, and four. Does that mean that it never happens? Do we not have enough data? Or if not, then we would like to be able to express this fact. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that increased coverage leads to more vacuous maps because frequent, rare and exceptional patterns will be represented on the map. 
Thirdly, and more seriously, semantic maps could not be generated automatically at the time. It was considered not mathematically well-defined, the model, or com computationally tractable, uh, and so it was impossible to use with large and highly variable cross-linguistic data sets. It's not possible to create a map of 10, 12 functions for thousands of languages by hand. So an alternative turned up called proximity maps, uh, whereas a semantic map, well, in general, a semantic map is a way to visually represent the interrelationships between functions or meanings expressed in languages. Classical semantic maps typically take the form of a graph or network. So the nodes stand for edges, the nodes stand for functions, and the edges or lines stand for relationships. In proximity maps, the alternative approach, you do not have graphs. Functions are represented by points distributed on a two-dimensional space, and there are no connecting lines. Proximity maps are based on statistical scaling techniques, such as multidimensional scaling, MDS, and the distance between two meanings in a two-dimensional Euclidean plane is iconic to the chance of co-occurrence of these meanings within a single linguistic expression. I think we're going to have to look at an example to understand that. So here's the example from a seminal paper by Croft and Poole uh, about the use of multidimensional scaling in language typology. I apologize for the fact that it's not very legible, but this is essentially Huspelmutt's indefinite pronoun data, um, which has been processed using MDS to create this, uh, this plot. <coughs> Excuse me. Points in the plot represent the functions of the indefinite pronoun positioned in two-dimensional space using MDS. You can maybe just about make out that the fact that the, the one at the bottom there says question, that's one of the functions, right? The proximity of the points reflects semantic similarity as inferred from the data. And the axes do not, in principle, represent actual semantic distinctions. But see the next slide. With such a map, you can use what's called cutting lines to show boundaries of language specific forms. So here we have three cutting lines which show, show boundaries for Romanian prefix ori, the suffix va, and the prefix ni, and the circumfix vreon. And you can superimpose the graph structure onto the two dimensional visualization in order to demonstrate compatibility between classical semantic maps and proximity maps. So it's, the software itself has not created these lines. These have been drawn by hand to, uh, to show that the functions um, can be connected without any crossing of lines. And that horseshoe pattern is typical of such maps. So that's the use of multidimensional scaling, uh, one use of it. Here's a second use of it uh, by Bernard Welschli from 2010. This is an exemplar-based probabilistic semantic map also created using MDS. So the position of points on each of these two maps shows the distribution of 190 motion event clauses from translations of the Gospel of Mark uh, in 153 languages based on the similarity or dissimilarity between the local phrase markers, that's to say add positions uh, and or case markers used in each clause. The colors and the shapes of the points correspond to the mapping of the Finnish and Wolof uh, coding means respectively. So uh, if we try and look at uh, the, the, one, the graph on the left, we see uh, from the legend that the red squares uh, re um, represent the illative um, case in Finnish. The blue circles are the elative. The green triangles are the allative. As you know, Finnish has many, many cases, 16 different cases or something like that. And you can see that the illative, the red squares, cluster together in the bottom right corner. The elative cluster together in the bottom left corner. 
and the allative cluster tends to cluster with the illative in the bottom right corner. Now the question is, what do the um, axes actually represent? They are, because of the method that's used, multidimensional scaling, they are abstract dimensions in a, of a Euclidean plane and they do not have any uh, specific semantics uh, per se, but it's possible in many cases to interpret what those ac axes are actually telling us. And Vegli has done this um, for this map and claims that the x-axis essentially represents uh, semantic roles. So you have um, source concepts with a low x value and goal concepts with a high x value and that the y axis represents a combination of animacy and localization. So we have the uh, animate goal, inanimate goal distinction along the y axis um, and also the companion uh, high up on the y axis. So those are proximity maps. Let's talk briefly about the breadth of coverage of semantic maps. As of today, they cover a large number of domain and they are of three major types, grammatical or constructional. And we've seen examples of dative and definite pronouns and reflexives. Uh, later on, we'll see depictive adjectivals as an example of constructional maps. Or they can be lexical, and we've seen the example of wood and tree, and we'll also see examples about relating to breath, uh, the action of breathing, motion events, and time. Let's start with lexical semantic maps and a seminal paper by Alex Francois from 2008, in which he first applied semantic maps to lexical typology. He starts by saying, at first sight, the capacity of the human brain to detect analogies in one's environment is infinite and should logically result in lexical polysemy having no limits. However, a great deal of lexical polysemies are in fact widespread across the world's languages and as such deserve to be highlighted and analyzed. So what Francois does is to reduce polysemous lexemes, lexemes which have multiple meanings, to atom, semantic atoms or senses. And then he creates an etic grid that allows for cross-linguistic comparison. Now languages differ as to which senses they co-lexify, that's to say lexify identically. For example, there are languages which use one and the same word to denote skin and bark, because the bark of a tree is conceptualized as being a kind of a skin. Right? Not every, every language does it by any means, but, but many languages do. Now each lang lexeme is language specific, but individual pairings of co-lexified sentences, such as skin and bark, can be compared across languages. And the result is what Francois calls an empirical atomistic approach to lexical typology. And it's exemplified by the notion of breathe. And this is a simplified version of the map which Alex comes up with. So you have breathe as a central uh, concept here, and then various senses in which this words meaning breathe are used in various languages. And he superimposes on this then uh, lines which, which show how four different forms in the languages, Nelemwa, English, Motlap, and Russian, uh, utilize this space. So this is an application of exactly the same kind of principle that you have in uh, grammatical semantic maps to the lexicon. You can go a stage further than this and talk not just about the synchronic state of languages in terms of the lexicon, but also uh, diachrony, so the historical development of the meanings of words. And Jörgo Kopoulos and Polis, in a paper which is still being revised, but which was presented at a talk last week, extend classical semantic maps to diachronic lexical semantics. 
they take a quantitative approach to large scale synchronic polysemy data and combine it with a qualitative evaluation of the diachronic material. And this is one of the maps that they come up with covering the domain of time related concepts. Uh, we see that uh, we have concepts like day, sun and day. Day, not night, is, means what we generally understand by day um, as opposed to night. There is also a concept of day as 24 hours, which is uh, shown separately in the map. And you have related concepts like God, sky, weather, time, hour, clock, etc. The... Um, this map actually provides you with a lot more information than a standard uh, classical semantic map because the colors have meaning and the thickness of the lines also has meaning. So the colors represent clusters of closely related concepts. So sky, heaven, cloud and above are seen to be very closely related uh, as are sun, day, moon and light. Um, and the thickness of the lines represents the strength of the colexification between those meanings. So how often those uh, two meanings, for example, the between hour and clock, let's look at those where you have a very thick line, are very often uh, represented by one and the same item. And therefore the line is much thicker than in other cases. And Jörg Kopoulos and Polis say the blend of tools well established in linguistic typology, that's to say semantic maps, with proven methods of historical linguistics enables a principled approach to long standing questions in the fields of diachronic semasiology and onomasiology. They create a weighted diachronic semantic map which has even more information. This is an example taken from the lecture last week. And here you not only have the underlying semantic map with the nodes and the arcs, but also arrows and other connectors between nodes, which provide lots of different information. For example, uh, they tell you about directionality, um, whether um, a connection is attested or reconstructed. They differentiate between um, extensions of meaning which are due to metonymy or metaphor and they talk also about loose diachronic colexification and strict diachronic colexification so there is a lot of information in this map it is actually the first lexical semantic map based on cross-linguistic material that integrates the diachronic dimension it treats synchronic and diachronic colexification patterns in a unified fashion without merging different types of information. And I'm uh, indebted to Thanasis Yogokopoulos for sending this to me the day before yesterday, I think. We're nearing the end now, but I will need to talk about constructional semantic maps. Um, remember, we've talked about grammatical semantic maps, lexical semantic maps. Semantic maps can also um, handle constructions. In constructional semantic maps, the conceptual space still consists of functions or meanings. However, we're no longer mapping individual grams, such as English two, or lexemes, such as the Norwegian word tre, but rather whole classes of such items, constructions. And there is a very nice example of this in a pilot study of depictive adjectivals by Van der Auerer and Malchukov in 2006. It's an exploratory pilot study of 15 languages with a six-way typology in which you find the functions depictive, predictive, appositive, restrictive, complementative, and adverbial. So what, what are all of these? We're basically talking about adjectives and adverbs to put it in simple terms. So a depictive is an example like George left the party angry angry is a depictive. A predicative is simply George was angry and an attributive is the angry men left the party and we see that in English all three of these are expressed in the same way. Important to know that we're not just talking about the word angry here, we're talking about a whole class of, uh, of, of, of um, 
linguistic items. We'll see an example in a minute. So this is a map of the English adjective, if you like, uh, and the uh, outside box in, um, in green shows you that the morphology um, is the same for all three functions. It's the invariable form of the adjective. Whereas the syntax is different for the predicative because it requires the copula. You cannot say George angry, you have to say George was angry if you want to predicate the angriness of George. What um, van der Aure then do is to split the attributive category into two, which they call a positive and restrictive, and add uh, the complement complementative and the adverbial functions to give the map that we see here. Uh, and we have examples on the left. Note that in English, there's not much of a distinction between a positive and restrictive, so we can use the same example for both. An example of the complementative is, I consider John intelligent. And the adverbial function, George left the party angrily. So what we see is the English adjective encompasses all the top five functions, but the English adverb is used for the adverbial function. But it's not like that in every language. For example, in Dutch, you have an invariable adjective and adverb, which is allows you to express the predicative, the complementative, the depictive, and the adverbial, but not the appositive and the restrictive. For that, you need the inflective adjective. In Schule, you have a tense of the verb called the third tense, which covers the complementative, the depictive, and the adverbial. And you have the same thing, exactly the same thing in Tamil with the invariable adverbial participle. But Tamil also has a variable adverbial participle, which represents the positive and the restrictive. So these are the various ways in which um, language specific constructions map on to the language general um, conceptual space of depictive adjectivals. Winding up now, I'd like to first mention a few issues concerning data collection. First of all, we have the problem of uh, language sample. For example, uh, the size of the sample is, uh, is critical. There is the question of the granularity of meanings, whether you have higher resolution, which gives you more detailed and more accurate maps, or lower resolution, which is good for general tendencies, but may fail to capture more infrequent patterns. And then there's the quality of the collected material, which is best ensured by identifying comparable phenomena across languages. And at this point, I have to mention clicks, the cross-linguistic, the database of cross-linguistic collexifications which is an online database where the data is freely available, covering 3,156 language varieties and 2,919 concepts. It's essentially a tool for investigating cross-linguistic semantic associations and for investigating things like semantic change, patterns of conceptualization, and even linguistic paleontology. Here's an example from clicks centered on the meaning sun, which shows uh, a little lexical semantic map uh, of related concepts. Uh, you can drag this thing around, you can click on different nodes and get up other sub parts of the network and it's a lot of fun to play with. So I encourage you to go to clicks.clrd.org and, and have a look. The very last point before we come to the, uh, the, the last two advantages and the summary, automatic plotting. In 2003, classical semantic maps had to be constructed by hand. This meant they could not be used with large data sets, but that's changed now. Thanks to a network inference algorithm developed by Rija et al in 2013. 
This consists basically of a Python script. Um, all you do is you uh, plug your data into a, an Excel spreadsheet like this one here. You run your Python script and out pops a graph. Um, there's a URL down the bottom which shows you where to go for the Python script and the input file format. format. The documentation is rather sparse, so I thought um, I would uh, just explain how to interpret this uh, Excel sheet. If we look at the graph, we see nodes V1, V2, V3, and V4, and we see uh, uh, regions uh, labeled S1, S2, and S3. What do they actually mean? Well, let's take, I'll go back to our example of indefinite pronouns and look at just a small part of the graph which has the same shape, right? So if you rotate that graph a little bit, you'll see that it's got the same shape uh, of four nodes connected by three arcs as the uh, example on the screen. Um, what you have to do is uh, give meaningful labels to the vertices representing functions. That's V1, V2, V3, and V4. So V1, <coughs> excuse me, is indirect ne negation. V2 is comparative. Uh, V3 is direct negation and V4 is free choice. And then you populate the spreadsheet for each language and function. So here we have three languages, the Icelandic represented by the gram prefix n, Swedish represented by the form somhelst, and Maltese represented by the form ebba. Remember we're talking about indefinite pronoun constructions here. For Icelandic, we see that there are ones in the column for indirect negation and direct negation. For Icelandic, we have ones in the column for comparative and free choice. And in Maltese, we have ones in the column for indirect <laughs> negation, comparative and direct negation. And this allows us then to see that the, uh, the three regions S1 and S2 and S3 will then correspond to, to what we have on the graph. So that's essentially how you complete that Excel form, uh, that Excel spreadsheet in order to use the Python script. Two final slides on the advantages for historical linguistics of uh, semantic maps. We already made the point that semantic, synchronic semantic maps can be interpreted diachronically. They can make predictions about the meanings to which a given form could extend. And we've now seen that a proper, proper methodology has been elaborated. That's the one by Jörger Kopoulos and Polis for diachronic semantic maps. And these explicitly visualize attested pathways of evolution, kinds of semantic extension, metaphorical and metonymic and their different extension types, loose or strict. But there are also advantages for documentation. Semantic maps help field linguists know what to look for. So does your dative form, whatever it might be, a case affix or an apposition, which you already know to express direction and recipients, also express purpose, experience, beneficiary, etc.? If so, is the connectivity hypothesis respected or is there a gap? giving you a donut shape. Can any gaps be accounted for by diachrony or contact? Another question, does the word meaning wood in the language you are documenting also mean tree? What else does it mean? And how does its polysemy network relate to those expressed in the semantic map? So by referring to semantic maps of different domains, field linguists can get a lot of input as to the kinds of things they should be looking for and how loud they should shout if they find something which falsifies the data that we already have. To conclude, semantic maps can be classified along multiple axes. By geometry, you have graph-based classical maps in which you have nodes and arcs. These con constitute an explanance, that's to say an explanation for something. And you have proximity-based uh, maps, which are points in Euclidean space, which themselves are explanandum, that's to say, things which require an explanation, as Bernard Welshley explained the positioning of the points in his, uh, his um, proximity map. 
you can classify them by object of study. So you can classify, you can study grammatical uh, morphemes or grams. You can classify, you have lexical maps and you have constructional maps. And you can classify semantic maps by the viewpoint they take, whether it's synchronic, looking at universal predictions or diachronic, looking at grammaticalization and lexicalization. And they are a theory neutral, implicational and falsifiable tool and method. They're an excellent tool for cross-linguistic research, allowing us to study both universals and language specific grammatical knowledge. These are my references. I will leave you with a quote from Bill Croft. And I will thank my sponsors without whose help this talk could never have been prepared in the two weeks I had of lockdown in Oslo. Thank you very much. Thank you, and don't forget to click like and leave your comments under me. I'll be joking. Now I'll switch this off. Right.